Okay, folks, today we are going to dive into Nourishing Traditions, which is the book that is authored by Sally Fallon. And basically it's what kicked off her entire dietary ideology and what has led so many people into following the Weston A. Price Foundation and all of its dietary and nutritional recommendations. At the beginning of that book, it, uh, most of it is a cookbook, really, the majority of it. However, the first portion of it, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how many pages we're talking about here. I, I believe it's less than a hundred, uh, are devoted to justifying the views and essentially the recipes, the dietary recommendations made later in the book. Uh, so I have a copy of this book and on the screen there you will see, I'm sorry it's kind of a crappy image, um, so what I've done is I wanted to take an image, this is from page four of Nourishing Traditions, we're going to be focusing on this paragraph right here about a man named Nathan Pritikin. Uh, however, I wanted to make sure that you'd be able to read those words, so I've uh, typed that paragraph into Notepad here, uh, but I'll be keeping this uh, in the background as well so you can verify that I'm not uh, making up anything that is said in the book. Again, this is from page four. Uh, of Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. And just before I get started with this, I wanted to make the point, the entire approach that I'm taking here with the Weston A. Price Foundation and its dietary and nutritional claims, um, excuse me as I hydrate myself, um, You know, nutrition is such an intimidating topic for so many people, and myself included, quite honestly. Uh, I have not felt like devoting the time to researching all these claims until I became so alarmed with what I was seeing uh, the Weston A. Price Foundation put out there, uh, specifically them, that uh, I decided it was time to uh, look into what they're claiming and find out whether or not it's true. And we will be getting to those types of videos. I think there are already others out there, though they don't specifically claim, uh, don't specifically deal with the claims made by, uh, can I just call them WAPF? Um, tired of saying the entire name. They don't deal with all the claims that are specifically made by WAPF. So that is going to be my aim. Uh, however, because the field of nutrition requires uh, all this research into matters that require uh, some technical knowledge and uh, they're, they're not easily grasped. It's, it's, uh, you definitely have to spend a lot of time, I think, researching these matters before you can start to gain a feel for what's going on and some confidence uh, in it. So instead of diving into that from the beginning, what I have preferred to do instead and what I think is an effective approach for other people who feel similarly to, to myself is to look at other side claims uh, made by this organization that can be much more easily validated or invalidated without that specialized knowledge. Uh, it, it's basically to say, if you catch a man lying about one thing, then there's a, uh, let's put it this way, if you have a auto mechanic and uh, let's say he's your next door neighbor and you lent him $50 and then a month later, you asked him, hey, Bob, can I have my, can you repay that $50? And he says, well, I'm not going to repay that. You, I, I didn't borrow $50 from you. Um, if he lies to you about something like that, then what is the likelihood that you're going to entrust him 
uh, to fix your car when you have no good way of knowing whether or not he is if you can easily tell if you know that if you've caught him in a lie about something that you can easily discern the truth of the matter then why would you trust him over something that you will not be able to easily discern the truth of the matter so my approach has been if if i examine some of the if I don't start out with the heavy nutritional claims, but instead start, you know, ease my way into it and see whether they're making things up, if they're skewing the truth of matters related to nutrition, but not uh, directly involved with it, then I can, uh, then I'm definitely establishing a basis for whether or not I should believe the technical claims that they're making so uh, that's that's what we're going to be doing in this video so on page four of nourishing traditions this paragraph is in regards to a man named nathan pritikin and i don't think much more introduction is needed let's go ahead and just read uh, what felon has written here the most well-known advocate uh, starting down here, by the way, the most well-known advocate of the low-fat diet was Nathan Pritikin. Actually, Pritikin advocated, uh, uh, let me just give a little more background here first, though. Remember, this is page four of the book, okay? So this is, and this is actually the fourth paragraph on that page, and this is in the it's under the section named fats. So basically what Fallon is trying to, the case she's going to lay out here is that uh, essentially fat is good for you, okay? Completely contrary to most mainstream nutritional advice, uh, fat is good for you, okay? So what she's doing here is she's going to, uh, this is the fourth paragraph of that section, right? So if we catch her in a, in lies in this paragraph, then we've just invalidated a very important foundation of her entire thesis, which is that fats are good for you. Okay, so let's continue. Actually, Pritikin advocated elimination of sugar, white flour, and all processed foods from the diet and recommended the use of fresh raw foods whole grains, and a strenuous exercise program, but it was the low-fat aspects of his regime, regime that received the most attention in the media. Adherents found that they lost weight and that their cholesterol levels and blood pressure declined. The success of the Pritikin diet was probably due to a number of factors having nothing to do with the reduction in dietary fat. Weight loss alone, for example, will lower cholesterol, at least at first. But Pritikin soon found that the fat-free diet presented many problems, not the least of which was the fact that people had trouble staying on it. Those who possessed enough willpower to remain fat-free for any length of time developed a variety of health problems, including low energy, difficulty in concentration, depression, weight gain, and mineral deficiencies. Pritikin may have saved himself from heart disease, but his low-fat diet did not help him recover from leukemia. He died in the prime of life of suicide when he realized that his Spartan regime was not working. We shouldn't have to die of either heart disease or cancer or consume a diet that makes us depressed. Okay, so the difficulty here is knowing where to begin with problems in this <clears throat> paragraph. For now, I'm not even going to deal with the claim um, made here that <clears throat> patients in Pritikin's, following Pritikin's fat-free dietary recommendations developed these problems with low energy, difficulty, and concentration, blah, blah, blah. I'm leaving that alone. Uh, we can deal with that another time. Now it's not the time to deal with that. What I would like to call attention to is the are some of the implications, the strong implications that she's using. I mean, she's placed this paragraph so prominently in the section because she wants to start sliding you down the slope into believing the 
thesis that she's presenting of fats are good for you. Fats are necessary for health. They're vital to your health. All fats. Cholesterol is good. Fat is good. Blah, blah, blah. This is a very key paragraph in establishing that premise. So, so we have here, okay, first, first thing, uh, Pritikin soon found pr a pr problems with his fat-free diet, not the least of which was the fact that people had trouble staying on it. Okay, so what? People have trouble going to the gym on a regular basis, uh, maintaining an exercise program. Does that mean that the recommend that saying that exercise is that we should be exercising is a, a flawed piece of advice? It's a completely irrelevant point. Uh, it's it's irrelevant in the in the sense that it says nothing about whether or not fat is good for you or bad for you. And and she's obviously trying to make the implication that because people had trouble staying on this diet, it means that the diet was flawed from a nutritional standpoint. It's irrelevant and therefore deliberately misleading. Next. Pritikin may have saved himself from heart disease, but his low-fat diet did not help him recover from leukemia. Okay, first of all, it's like she wants to belittle the fact that the man saved himself from heart disease. Big deal. It's only the number one killer in the country, right? But <clears throat> the fact that he was uh, did groundbreaking research into low-fat diets and helped save himself from his own heart disease is of no importance whatsoever, apparently, in the mind of Sally Fallon. What is important is that his diet did not save him from leukemia. So are we to conclude from this that Sally's diet will save people from leukemia? Is that a standard claim for people following the WAF diet? Is it or is it not a condemnation of a low-fat diet or any other diet for that matter that it would not save its adherence from a disease like leukemia. Does that invalidate the diet? It's a completely ridiculous insinuation that his diet is invalid because the man was not able to <clears throat> never got rid of his leukemia. Next, and this is the most pathetic part of this paragraph. He died in the prime of life. Okay, now let's let's go to Wikipedia and see what they have to say about Nathan Pritikin. Remember, let's not forget. Nathan, according to Sally, Sally Fallon, died in the prime of life. How long did Nathan Pritikin live? Let's see, he was born in 1915 and died in 1985. 70 years old. Does that sound to you like the prime of life? Now, how many people reading this book are going to bother to go and look up how long did Nathan Pritikin live? I'd say it's a pretty relevant piece of information to say that the implication being that he died when he was 40 years old or so, and his low-fat diet didn't save him. Therefore, uh, you know, we have somebody who ate a low-fat diet and he died when he was 40. Therefore, and he was a pioneer of it, and now everybody since then has advocated similar types of diets and. Uh, because one of its major founders was died when he was 40, it just goes to show that the entire low-fat fad is, is just a complete farce and a lie that's built on the advice of somebody who couldn't even live past the prime of his life. 70 years old sounds like a pretty good long life to me, well past the prime of his life. It's pathetic. This is the type of stuff that's all over this book, and... People just lap it up. It's incredible. This kind of plain, there, there's no excuse for making a mistake like this.